Hello and welcome to our short module on an introduction to force plots. Today we're going to be talking about um, why force plots were invented and where they came from. We're going to be explaining what is a force plot and what are some of the uses for them. And we're going to be describing how to interpret a force plot as well as to look at some of the pros and cons associated with them. But first I'd like to start with the why. Why were force plots invented and why do we use them in healthcare? And it started with the rise of evidence-based practice, which from that came a rapid growth in the amount of systematic reviews being done, which is fantastic because systematic reviews really do help us to have a stronger level of evidence that can help guide clinical practice. Now, although systematic reviews are not required to always have a meta-analysis done, they often do. And this is where force plots become really important um, because that meta-analysis created a need for, uh, for us to have an easy and effective way to see information about the studies that were included in, a, um, in all in one place and a, in a summary that was easy to understand. And, you know, that's what a force plot basically is. Um, now, before we, you know, we go in and talk specifics about it, it's important to also know the origin of where it came from. And the first thing that uh, comes to mind is the name. You know, why is this called a forest plot? And uh, the, the first miscon you know, misconception and first uh, area that typically we go is that, you know, some doctor invented it. Um, it's common, you know, for a doctor and inventor, you know, to name their, their findings or their creation at after themselves, we see that in healthcare quite often, and um, so the first easy misconception is that Dr. Forrest somewhere invented the Forrest plot, but that is a myth. Uh, the, in reality, what the truth is, is that Forrest plot, the name itself, came from the fact that those lines, when put together and designed in a way such as the Forrest plot does, it, uh, it reminds, it indicates and alludes to a forest of, of lines or, or a tree, a uh, forest of trees, which is also difficult to kind of imagine. You have to get very creative. But if you, you know, kind of just post the pictures, you, you can see a little bit where that's coming from, and it makes more sense. So that's the truth of where the name came from. However, uh, and the name itself, though, was not really used in print until 1996 was the first um, time that, that it was printed in an article uh, on a review of nursing interventions for pain, um, again, published in the mid-90s. Um, but the origin of forest plots go way back, um, at least into the you know, mid to late 70s. Uh, you see here a Freeman displayed the results of several studies uh, with horizontal lines that were showing the confidence intervals here, um, as well as, as the, the result in the middle, um, and uh, as the point estimate associated with that. But uh, this was not a meta-analysis, so the results of the individual studies were not combined to show an overall result. The first time that that was done uh, as a meta-analysis was in 1982. Um, so you see there um, the first version of it that does have a pooled um, estimate of the combined results in there. Okay, now that we, we looked at the, the why and some of the origin, uh, let's talk about how to interpret uh, the force plot. And this is an example that I got from the uh, Cochrane website, which was originally uh, published on the Students for Best uh, Evidence uh, blog, which I, I highly recommend those two uh, are great resources for EBM content. So this is what a typically a force plot looks like. And you see here the studies on the left normally are listed chronologically. Um, and um, and you see the alters, the first alters, the last name in there. Um, then you see the size of the studies. And in, in this case, you know, it shows the intervention group and the control group. Um, and the, the weight that the study was given for the analysis. The larger the study, the more weight it receives. And it's also represented here by the size of the squares. So a larger study has a larger square, a smaller study has a smaller square. This also is represented by the whiskers here of the confidence intervals associated with it. So a smaller study will have larger confidence intervals. It didn't have enough people to, to be very confident that the point estimate is correct. Um, like a smaller study will have a smaller confidence interval. This is also a very quick and easy way to see statistical significance of a study. So you see the line of no effect here that shows that if any of the studies, you know, the confidence intervals crosses this line of no effect, it means it's not a statistically significant. It, this could have been found by chance. Um, so even though the individual studies don't have a p-value associated with them in this example here, 
you can you can know automatically that it crosses the line of effect it has no statistical significance same thing with the pooled result here which is indicated by this uh, this uh, loss angle here but that shows that this is, is the pyramid is crossing the, the line of no effect um, which is represented by the p-value down here of 0.7 um, and uh, which is higher than in you know, 0.05 so it's definitely not statistically significant what you also see at a, at a glance here is uh, the test for heterogeneity, where, which is indicated you know, by the I square. So a high I square means there is a lot of heterogeneity, a low I square means there isn't. In this case here, there is there is not. And you can also quickly, by doing the eyeball test, which is another benefit of the forest plot, that if the confidence intervals of the studies overlap with each other, that there is no heterogeneity. If they were all over the place, then uh, there likely would be. And you will see that also, and here it tells you the type of analysis that was done. So this was uh, was done a fixed effects rather than a random effects. A fixed effects looks at each of the studies based on their actual uh, effects and, and uh, the outcome rather than adjusting that uh, based on the heterogeneity. So if this I square was over 50%, for instance, you would want um, a random effect likely to be done. So that's a quick example and, and, uh, and look in here of um, a, um, a typical uh, forest plot. Now let's apply that into a, a real life example and I'll give a little context as well. So this is a, a very famous uh, book, Dr. Spock's best-selling book on uh, uh, on child care that uh, at the time of this you know picture here it says that it had uh, over 13 million copies sold but actually you know, up to today is over been over 50 million copies sold uh, it's the uh, best-selling book out of 20th century you know, outsold only by the Bible and um, the interesting thing about this is that uh, and the problem associated with that is that for 25 years this book was giving little advice basically on um, on how babies should sleep. Um, Dr. Spock at that time he recommended from you know the addition of well, 56 into about you know, um, you know late 70s that uh, babies should be sleeping on their stomach um, for, and uh, because if they were on the back they could throw you know uh, choke on their own throw up or that their head would you know would be flat on one side based on the position they sleep. Today we know that that's not true and the sad thing is that that recommendation over time in millions of, of hospitals and families using caused tens of thousands of, of babies to uh, unfortunately um, to die preventable deaths. So what I wanted us to talk to, we're going to look at the systematic review of these studies and and apply the, what we learned today um, and some of, uh, some of the uh, the ways to analyze a forest plot associated with that. Um, and then what you're seeing here is that over time, and we're going to see what that looks like as well, there were several studies being done uh, looking at the, uh, the efficacy. Do you sleep on your back uh, or do you put the babies to sleep on, on their stomach? Um, and uh, we're going to look at the results of them. And But unfortunately, only on the 90s, you know, campaigns, you know, both in the UK and, and uh, in, the, in the States, uh, were really active on uh, on really disseminating the evidence and the systematic review, which is this one here that we're looking at, the results of the meta-analysis, was done in 2005. So here to apply some of the principles that we learned uh, on the previous slides, uh, you see that uh, there is not a lot of heterogeneity because, you know, the the eyeball test tells you that the confidence intervals are really nicely overlapping. Uh, some of the studies are not statistically significant because they do cross the line of no effect here in the middle. Um, and But majority of them here are. But the overall pooled effect is, you know, highly statistically significant. Actually, the odds ratio shows it's almost four and a half times, um, you know, better off, you know, going with uh, sleeping on their backs rather than on their stomach. Um, now, Another thing that's very important to be able to do, and you see all the different studies listed chronologically as well, uh, is when looking at a meta-analysis is also to consider a, the cumulative meta-analysis because it shows not just the each individual uh, study and its specific findings, but also the cumulative finding of the studies over time. And by doing this here, you could see that Basically, after 1970 forward, there was already a statistical significant 
result and understanding that sleeping on their backs was uh, was was much better, you know, for the for the babies for survival and so forth. So um, every study done hereafter caused babies to die unnecessarily. Um, so that's really important to be able to look at um, the cumulative analysis of it. So very uh, looking at the pros and cons because there are some things that the forest plot is really good at doing and, and to be able to analyze it. And heterogeneity is one of them as we identify both via the eyeball test as well as identifying the I-square and statistical heterogeneity aspects of it. It's really good to be able to show a pooled combined result of the different studies together. But it's not a, a good uh, plot or good test to be able to show publication bias, which would look at you know some of the smaller studies that were not published, perhaps because they didn't have a, a statistically significant uh, result. And for that, a, um, a funnel plot is a much more appropriate uh, plot to be able to use for it. So to summarize what we have done today, um, we revealed why force plots are invented, including their origin and the history associated with it. We, dis we explained what a force plot is, we described how to interpret them, and highlighted the pros and cons associated with the force plot. So for more information, I do encourage you to, uh, to go to some of the references that I have listed here and um, also that you have available in the handout for download. And uh, thank you for your time today.